book. And uh, I took the Bible chart and showed him how every, everything from, from I, I quickly gave him a survey of the Bible. You'll see it here in Acts 14. Is that from Genesis 1 through 11, the nations have turned to idolatry and God turned from the nations and separated out Abraham. And from Genesis 12 all the way until the calling and commissioning of the Apostle Paul in the middle of the book of Acts, God's dealings was with, was with the nation of Israel. And then when God raised up the Apostle Paul, I went back and showed him how Paul revealed the cross and that that caused God to postpone his wrath and his return, the return of Jesus Christ, because God will today is for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And then pointed out to them that they can read about that in Romans to Philemon and directed, immediately directed them to the part of the Bible that's for us today. Uh, now I say that to you because I realize... We've been a long time in the book of Acts, and we do study a lot of detail, and then you realize how little detail. I mean, even the idea that, oh, you're supposed to go to the Bible to get your faith it, to the world is something they never thought of, because they went to church to get their faith. They went to a religious leader. They went to their denomination, never thought to go to the Bible themselves. And uh, so you realize that sometimes you, you just... You get almost unattached from where most of the world's at. But uh, we are thankful that not only do we study the Bible, I always think of what the apostles were told, to reach into treasure and pull out things new and old. So yeah, there's some things that are old that you've seen before, and then there's always something new, and hopefully we'll, we'll do both of that. Now, in Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 13 is actually Paul's first apostolic ministry. Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles started his Gentile ministry, is the launching of his Gentile ministry, or the expansion as I would call it, in chapter 13. And, that, uh, uh, and, and, and so in, in chapter 13, I, the reason I put that map up here, is Paul left, here's Jerusalem down here in the southern end of that yellow. I know you can't see the cities, but the late... The land of Israel is this area, and there's Jerusalem, where the 12 apostles are ministering. The apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, got saved, but he ends up in Antioch, and there he's ministered for some time, and now in Acts 13, it's, the verse says, separate me, Saul, Barnabas and Saul, his name Paul was Saul then, it referred to as Saul, for the work that I've called them, and Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Paul then launch, they go into the area of Cyprus, they come up in the the southern end of Pamphylia, and then they worked their way to this area right here, which is Antioch, Poseidon. They left Antioch, Syria. They end up in Antioch, Poseidon. That's Acts chapter 13. When we came to Acts chapter 14, they left Antioch, Poseidon, and, and we said that in the first 20 verses that Paul goes to three or four other cities. We don't have to get into that, but we've already covered him in one city when he... When he left Antioch, I got to even look at it myself. When he left Antioch, Poseidon, he came to Iconium, just a little bit to the east. This area, is, by the way, is what we call Turkey. This is Greece down here. Macedonia is up here. Rome is over here. Jerusalem and that is over there. So you get an idea. He's launching. He's out among the Gentiles. The first city is in Iconium. But, but there, and it's funny because when, when we get into an overall view there, of the city that he's now going to go to is Lystra, that when he's in Lystra, you'll see, we're going to study the activity that took place there, but what's strange is you really don't know who or how many in Lystra came to faith. There's no indication of who's a believer. The reason I said that is when he went to Iconium, there was a great multitude that believed, verse 2, and then, uh, uh, no, verse 1, a great multitude believed, both of Jews and the Greeks. Uh, but then after some time, verse 4 of Acts 14 says, But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the, Jew, the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, that is to abuse them, and the way they were <laughs> abuse them is they're going to stone them to death, that was their plan. It says, they, uh, they were aware of it, and fled in, unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about. So there was plans to stone Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, here in, in Antioch, or no, here in Iconium, and when they, get, they hear about that, they don't give them the chance that it's time for them to get out of the city. 
Because not only were there the Jews, or the Gentiles and the Jews, but they had their rulers on their side. So they, they had the, the government against them as well. So they left. And when you come to verse 6, you're just told that they went to Lystra and Derby. Well, you, don't, you can't go to two cities. Which one did they go to? Lystra or Derby? Well, verses 8 through 18, they're in Lystra. In verse 20 and 21, they're in Derby. So you, you, verse 6 is where they left too. It's like an overall view. And then, uh, and, and then you'll get the details of what happened in Lystra, what happened in Derby when you, when you read on. But the point of verse 6 is when they heard it and they fled into Lystra and Derby, um, they're called cities of Lyconia. And then it says, and unto the region that lieth round about. You get the idea that when they crossed over from Antioch, Posida, or um, excuse me, when they crossed over from Iconium and came into Lystra, they're like in a different region. And it, as, as the possibility that whatever governmental officials in verse 5 uh, were, were part of the assault against Barnabas and Paul, that by crossing some border, they're free from that attack. And, and that's kind of a reference there to the region that round, round, lieth round about. It's also the fact that when they go to these different cities, that the effect isn't just in the city. That when they go to a city and, and, and minister there, ultimately the message that they brought to the city does reach the region round about. So you have that reference there that they went, uh, when they were aware of it, they fled into Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and the regions that lieth around about. Verse 7 says, and, 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 there, and there they preached the gospel. So they go into those areas and preach the gospel. And, and again, just so that, oh, I already did point it out. Antioch, there's Lystra, and if I don't get back here, Iconium, they're kind of like making a triangle, and, uh, and the, but they left the... Uh, no, they left. When they leave Iconium, they're going to Lystra, and then Derby. Where's Derby? Oh, Derby is back out, so it's a Z shape. But you can look on a Bible map. They're they're close cities there, but they're they're in another region. Um, so let's pick up and and study what takes place in in Lystra. Let let me read verses eight, and I'll probably just stop at fourteen because we're not going to cover all the verses, but you'll get an idea of what events are taking place. It says in verse 8, uh, And there uh, sat certain men at Lystra, uh, no, there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a crippled from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to, to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw that what, what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurus, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before the city, brought oxen and garland uh, unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out. And, and what they cried out is, Hey, I, we're here to preach to you to tell you to turn from these vanities. Because uh, the Gentiles, they're worshiping all these pagan things. And, and, uh, and, and so they, they went and they, they stopped them. As you get down to verse 18, they scarcely stopped them from sacrificing. Now, I'll, I'll let you read on all the way down to verse 18. But they certainly got a response from the people, didn't they? But it wasn't the right response because they're going to go off for sacrifice thinking they're gods and, and not just men. Uh, they do stop them from sacrificing to them, so there's a positive response in that way. But what Paul actually said, actually verse 15, when, when they stopped them, what they cried in verse 15 says, saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passion with you. So we're not gods, we're men. Uh, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all, and all things that are therein. So their witnesses turn from these vanities, but turn to the living God. Well, before it's done, you'll never hear whether they turn to the living God. They stopped them from receiving, offering a sacrifice, but it doesn't say anything about their faith, which is quite interesting and, and uh, 
a, a different response that when they were at Iconium, they finally, the people ran them out of Iconium when they got the rulers behind them, but there was a great multitude of believers in Iconium. You don't read of any believers in Lystra, although I would assume there were, but, uh, but the context here doesn't point out to the, to the positive response. It, it just shows a pagan response uh, to their preaching and how they, uh, what they would minister, what their message is to Gentiles who, who are pagans. So anyhow, you have them there at Lystra. Now, when they went to Lystra and Derby, verse 7 said something that I don't want to pass up. Uh, verse 7 says, when it said that they went to Derby, uh, Lystra and Derby and cities of Lyconia uh, unto the region that lieth round about, it says, and there they preached the gospel. Now, when it says there they preached the gospel, the word gospel means good news. And we know what they're preaching because we've already watched him in Acts chapter 13. Just flip back to verse 38. When he was there and there was Jews and Gentiles in a synagogue, his message summed up in this. He says in verse 38 of Acts 13, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that's, he just preached to them Jesus Christ, how he came, was died, God raised him from the dead. And he said, Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified, declared righteous by God, from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. He preached to him justification by faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The message, when Paul says, when it says there in chapter 14, verse 7, and there they preach the gospel, the gospel that he's preaching is, we call it justification by faith, coming out of the book of Romans, as it's explained there in the book of Romans. But we see it there in the book of Acts, that that's what he's preaching. We, we can go and he, there's his first recorded message, and we see that what he's preaching. He's preaching the good news about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Good news that when you kind of add a couple other verses, look down in chapter 13, verse 46, it says, the Jews who turned this message down and blasphemed, Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken unto you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. So when he talks about being forgiven and justification by faith, being justified from all things, that when you're justified from all things, you receive from God everlasting life. That's the gospel that he's preaching. And, uh, and then when, when you look as well to verse uh, 47, it says, So hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have sent thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. The gospel he's preaching is salvation from sin. Justification before God. Everlasting life. So when you get down to chapter, seven, uh, chapter 14, verse 7, and there they preach the gospel, that's the good news Paul's preaching. The reason I say that to you, it's surprising that in the book of Acts, I think, yeah, the word gospel is used six times. It's only been used once before this. Just flip back to chapter 8. And it's interesting. Chapter 8, this is when the twelve apostles, well, Peter and, and John, had seen the, the Samaritans uh, come to faith because of Philip's preaching went, laid their hands on them, and the Samaritans received the Holy Ghost. And, and then it says in verse uh, 25, it says, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now you'd have to have been with us from Acts chapter 1 all the way to Acts chapter uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, even 12, that the 12 apostles what they're preaching, the good news that they're preaching is the good news of the kingdom. That Jesus Christ died, was buried, rose again, and has been risen from the dead to sit on the throne of David. And that when Israel repents, Jesus Christ will come back and establish that kingdom. So that as we come to the close, uh, the close of the, the outreach of the Twelve Apostles' ministry here in Samaria, that, that's the first time we find the gospel mentioned. But this is the gospel of the kingdom. The twelve apostles aren't preaching the death, burial, and resurrection as the means of being justified before God, uh, um, but, it, but it's the good news about the kingdom. When God raised up the apostle Paul, the focus and the revelation to Paul is about the gospel, uh, about the cross work of Christ and the accomplishments of, of, cross, of Christ on the cross. So just one time before Paul is the word gospel mentioned, but then the other five times... 
now all center around the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. And, and follow those five times. We just saw Acts 14 and verse 7, just the phrase that they, he, there they preach the gospel. Um, look over at Acts chapter uh, 14 again in verse 21. It says, And when they had preached the gospel to that city they had taught, and taught many, uh, taught many, they returned again unto uh, Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, and they're confirming the soul of the disciples. So when they finally get to Derby there, they preach the gospel in that city. You come over to chapter 6 and verse 10. No, 16. <laughs> yeah, let's move forward. <laughs> it says, and after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. So it's all centered around Paul's ministry and the gospel that he preached. At Galatians chapter 1, Paul says, I certify that the gospel I preach, I didn't get it from men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The point is, in the book of Acts, when you're following Paul's ministry, it's the gospel that Paul preached. When the one time it's used in the book of Acts about Peter and John, it's the gospel the twelve preached. When you compare that to Galatians, where Paul talks about the gospel he preached, he didn't get it from men, he says in Galatians chapter 2 that Peter and, and the twelve, they preached, that Peter preached the gospel of the circumcision, the good news of what God's going to accomplish through Israel. Paul preached the gospel of the uncircumcision. So when you're reading these verses about Paul preaching the gospel, they're the, the gospel of the uncircumcision, the gospel of Gentile salvation, the gospel of justification, eternal life through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he calls it in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. He says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God, which is different than the gospel of the kingdom. Now, the cross is the means by which Israel will have a kingdom, but it's not until Acts 15 that the twelve apostles are going to understand more about the cross uh, and because of the, the meeting with the apostle Paul. But that's interesting. I'll just throw this out because look at Acts 15. This is where the twelve apostles and Paul are going to come together and they're finally going to understand what is this gospel of grace of God that Paul's preaching. Because the whole thing centers here about circumcision. Well, if they're preaching the gospel of the circumcision, how could Paul be telling people they don't have to be circumcised to be saved? Well, that's what Acts 15 is about. I know we're in Acts 14, so I'm not going to teach the chapter. But it's interesting that Paul comes and explains to them, and before you get to the explanation, there's, a, there's this meeting that's taking place by the elders and apostles with the Apostle Paul and, and, and Barnabas. And it says in, in, in Acts 15 and verse 7, it says, When there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That's interesting. <laughs> we'll talk about that when we get to chapter 15. Because <laughs> uh, that's interesting how, they, how Peter talks about that. But this is the place that Peter is understanding Paul's gospel. And, uh, but I, I said that it all follows Paul's, uh, uh, Paul's ministry. And I wanted to show you that one, not just leave one out. So go back to Acts chapter 14. Fourteen nine. Yeah, are you working your way down? Yeah, we're in Acts chapter fourteen. I just talked a little bit about verse seven. I don't know that there's something special in verse nine, but we're going to cover uh, at least uh, eight to ten right here. Because what I want you to look at is when you get to Lystra, it all seems to center around this man that's healed. And so I was looking at this real close, and I want you to notice ten facts that the Holy Spirit would have us to know about this man that's healed at Lystra. Verse 8 says, And there sat a certain man at Lystra. Now when it says a certain man, there's probably a whole bunch of people sitting there, right? The Holy Spirit wants us to know there was this certain man. There's something different about him or some reason God's going to use him as compared to some other people. There, was, there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet. That's the second thing. 
so that, you know, the idea that, er, that he's lame, he, he can't walk, goes on to say, being crippled from his mother's womb. So not only is he impotent, it's, it's been a lifetime uh, effect on him. He, he's born this way. It's from his, from his mother's womb. And then so the, the point is, who never, who had never walked. So you, you got a guy that's been lame that long. Verse 9, and the fourth one is this, the same heard Paul speak. They didn't, uh, you already read that you know, they called Paul Mercury because he was the chief speaker. Paul's doing the speaking. But this guy heard Paul speak, which is part of the significance of what's going, going on here. Um, and, and then it says, who steadfastly beholding him. Now, if you didn't read on, you wouldn't know who's looking at who. Is the man looking at Paul or is Paul looking at the man? Well, if you read on, you know it's Paul looking at the man. It says, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had the faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up on thy feet. Well, the man didn't say that. Paul said that. So it's like Paul standing there and this man is hearing Paul and Paul didn't just glance. I mean, this guy caught Paul's eye. <laughs> and and that, that, it's strange to say that. Who steadfastly beholding him. It's like Paul... Can you imagine if I was preaching, I just kept looking at you the whole time I talked? <laughs> That's kind of what's going on here. So Paul picks this man out, is looking at him, uh, steadfastly beholding him. And then, then Paul then says, beholding him, and perceived that he had faith to be healed. Paul, well, Paul's perceiving that this man is believing what he's hearing Paul speak. So he's believing the message. And, and, and so... He's hearing that, and, and, and Paul perceives that he had the faith to, to be healed. That's number six. And then number seven is, um, and said uh, with, a, with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. So just Paul said, stand. That's the, the, the sixth thing, or the seventh. That's, that's the seventh thing that I want you to note. I have these written down. I'll show them to you in a minute. And then, then the result of that, it says... Uh, and, and he leaped and walked. Now, you know, that's the thing about Bible miracles. Guy had cancer and he had, you know, six chemo treatments and now the cancer is gone. God did a miracle. <laughs> God, a man like Dan breaks his elbow and goes to therapy for months and finally his elbow's fixed. God healed him. Now, that's not healing. That's recovering. And we thank the Lord for recovery. But healed in the Bible, I mean, this guy never walked a day in his life. How does he even know how to balance? And forget balance, he leaps before he walks. <laughs> That'd be pretty scary. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, that, that, that's the miraculous healing that took place there. And, and so he leaped and walked. And, and then the ninth, thing, the ninth part of that, it says in verse 11, And when the people saw what Paul had done, now we know what they did, they're going to give credit to the gods, but the point is, is that the man leaping and walking caused a stir among the people. It, you know, it stirred up a crowd. And the point of this, remember when it talked about verse 13 there, then the prince, priest of Jupiter, which was before the city, brought oxen and garland and, uh, unto the gate and would have done sacrifice unto the people. They have a priest there to Jupiter. And, and so they're going to have a sacrifice. It's going to change their, their worship, Right. They have a, it doesn't say they have a temple, but they have like a temple worship to the God of Jupiter, and they have a priest of Jupiter who's now going to do sacrifice unto the God of Jupiter because they've come down among them in the form of Barnabas and Paul. And, and so what happened is the miracle caused a stir among the people, which with the preaching of Paul and Barnabas is going to change the way those people worship if they would listen to what he said, right? They're not going to let them worship this way. They go in and stop this and point them, tell them to turn from these vanities to the living God. It's going to change the way they worship based on the miracle that just took place. So you, you see those, those points of that. Now, now the, point, the point of it is that when a miracle is done in your Bible, it's not just to say, you know, God can heal. That a miracle is done to point out something here and what's being pointed out is a confirmation that the Apostle Paul has the message of God to the Gentiles. When the man heard Paul speak, Paul wouldn't be preaching about healing. He's not preaching about the kingdom. He's preaching about the cross work of Christ. 
and the man believed those things, and then there's a confirmation. When Paul said, stand on your feet uh, upright, and the man stand, leaps and walks, there's a confirmation then that what Paul is saying about Jesus Christ is true based on the fact that the miracle that Paul did showed that God is working through him. Not that they thought he was a God, but that God was working through him. We've said it last time because when we, were, we looked at chapter 14, look at verse 3. When they were in Iconium, it says, Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of His grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Now the reason it says their hands, Barnabas is, and Paul are, are the apostles that are speaking. Paul's the one who's doing the speaking, as we know in the context here. And, and when God's granting these to be done by their hands, it's to point out that their message is true. Last time we went back to Mark chapter 16 and pointed out that when the apostles were first sent out, the twelve apostles, it says that there, these signs would follow and they went out and preached and confirming the word with signs following. It's confirming that the words that they speak are speaking are the words of God. When the Apostle Paul goes out and says, I'm the Apostle of the Gentiles, and God's told me about good news about the cross work of Christ, and then he heals this man, all of a sudden you better listen to what he's got to say, because it's, the, the, the miracle proved he had the message for those people. And remember that God is now sending out a word to the Gentiles. That's what we read over in chapter 13. For so hath the Lord commanded us, verse 47, saying, I have sent thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be salvation for the ends of the earth. Paul, Paul's out there preaching salvation in Jesus Christ. He's got a revelation from God that's different than the twelve apostles. How do you know he's of God? Well, the miracle confirms it. The purpose of miracles was to confirm the message. And, you know, we, that's one of those things that I, I say, that sometimes we study deep, and, and to me, this is just like old news. But do you realize more of the phone calls that I get on the, on the telephone, even because of the Forgotten Truths re outreach and all, a lady called me this week, and do you believe in that God heals? So no, this is not the age when God is healing. This is the age of the long-suffering of God. But, but everybody just looks for the miraculous to be done without ever studying why miracles were done. And if God's word is complete, that's when Paul said that prophecy, knowledge, and tongues were going to cease. And if miracles are confirming the revelation that people are speaking prophetically, if God quits speaking prophetically, you don't need a confirmation. I, you don't have to ha I don't have to confirm what I'm saying to you. You've got a Bible in front of you. You just need to go and see if it's, it's right in the Scriptures. And so the purpose of miracles was to confirm the Word. Now, I showed it out of Mark, but just, just maybe a review for some of you, but go to back to uh, Exodus chapter 4. I think we'll be doing this in Sunday school as well. <laughs> Exodus chapter 4. The reason why is we're studying the book of Mark, concluding the book of Mark in Sunday school, and we're studying those verses <laughs> that talks about them going everywhere, confirming the word with signs following. The purpose of the sign was to confirm the word. I want you to know that the first time the word sign is used in your Bible is Exodus chapter 4. And so immediately, not only do you learn from the Bible that there were signs, you learn why signs were given in the first place. Exodus chapter 4 in verse 1, it says, And Moses answered and said, uh, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto, uh, unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Now God appeared to Moses in a burning bush out in the wilderness, because he already fled from Egypt, he hadn't lived in Egypt for 40 years, now God says, go into Egypt and tell the people, you go tell Pharaoh, let my people go, tell the people you follow me, and I'm going to lead you to the promised land that I promised Abraham. Well, I'd be just like Moses. Who am I to walk in there and say these things? They're not going to believe me. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto him, What is in thy hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses, and Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. Now he already ran from the serpent, but boy, he really has faith in God, doesn't he? 
Because God didn't just say, grab the serpent. didn't say, put your foot on his head and then grab him behind the, the head there. <laughs> he said, just reach down and grab him by the tail. And it says, and he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of, your, of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. That's why you're going to do this miracle. And the Lord said, Furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he, and when he uh, took, out, took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thy hand unto thy bosom again. And he put his hand unto his bosom again, and plucked it out and his bosom, uh, out of his bosom. And behold, it, had, it was turned again as, as other, his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, nor hearken unto the voice of the first sign, that's the first time that appears in your Bible, and that they will, uh, they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto the voice, thou shalt take of them the water of the river, and pour it out on dry land, and the water that thou takest out of the river shall become blood before the dry land. He gave three signs. God only speaks three times, doesn't he? That's consistent in your Bible, where God appears and makes a statement, and that third time, this is of God. God gives Moses three signs, and he calls it, the voice of the sign. Now Moses is going to say, God sent me to lead you out to the promised land. When he does the sign, the voice of the sign says, yep, this is of God. So that's the purpose of signs. And when the Apostle Paul does that, he's showing the sign. Now watch this. Come to Galatians chapter 2. I've already referred to a couple verses here in Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Now, Paul, when he writes the book of Galatians, people are turning from the grace of God, chapter 1, verse 6, unto another gospel. And what they were turning to is the gospel of the circumcision. They, they started believing you can't be saved unless you're circumcised because you've got to be part of, identified with Abraham and Israel in order to be God's people. But God had turned from Israel to the Gentiles. That's Paul's ministry. So he says in Acts, uh, Galatians 1 verse 11, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, neither, neither received, neither, for, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he, he's talking about the gospel that he has for the Gentiles is not the one that Peter had for the nation of Israel. But he says... He talks about that meeting that's going to take place in Acts 15. But, so when he goes there, it says in verse 7 of Acts chapter 2, uh, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2 verse 7. Now this is a reference to when Paul met with the twelve apostles. He said, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter... So there's two different messages for two different people, but two different messages and two different apostles. Peter to the circumcision, Paul to the uncircumcision, to the heathen it's going to be called, but with a different message. The gospel of uncircumcision, there is a gospel of circumcision. But, but watch verse 8. It says, For he that wrought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same... The same God that sent Peter to the circumcision with the gospel of the circumcision. But he didn't just send Peter with that message. He wrought effectual in Peter. You know what that means? God worked mightily in Peter. Up to this point in the book of Acts, we've been studying the ministry of Peter and the twelve apostles. Miracle after miracle was done. That's God wrought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. Verse 8 says, The same, the same God and the same effectual working, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. 
And when James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. So Paul's epistles are written to the Gentiles. Peter and James and John, when they write, they're writing to the circumcision, the, the Jewish believers. So the, the, what we're seeing in Acts chapter 14, the healing of this man, is the proof that he that wrought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in Paul to the apostleship of the Gentiles. Remember those 10 points? Get Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 14. Now we've already listed them from going through. Over on the left, in blue there, that's Acts chapter 14, Paul's ministry there at, at Lystra. Acts chapter 14. Three is where Peter is, and, and John began their ministry in Acts chapter 2, but now the Holy Spirit has come, the launching of their ministry out uh, uh, in Jerusalem uh, in the temple there begins in Acts chapter 3. And notice what's said there. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now when Peter and John went together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, and a certain man... Hey, that's how the other one started out. A certain man. The Holy Spirit, out of all the people there in the temple, there's a certain man the Holy Spirit wanted to point out. Just like at Lystra, there's a certain man, isn't there? And then what does it say about that certain man? Well, it says, a certain man, lame from his mother's womb. So there's a lame man. There's a man who is impotent in his feet. Acts 2, Acts 3 calls him lame. Acts 14 says, from his mother's womb. This, it says that the, the man was from his mother's womb. who had, uh, Well, uh, it's Acts 14, who had never walked. So you got, the same, you got the same kind of man with the same problem. And, and it's interesting the things that are being said there. Um, when, when the man in... in, uh, in uh, Lystra... No, it's not the same man. No, I'm, I'm going through the statements, but I've got two different lists in front of me. Um, I better go back. Okay, we're down to three. Okay, the, the, watch uh, Acts chapter 3, and just all we got to do is keep reading. Verse 2 again says, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried... Uh, from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John. Now, there's a little bit different in the fact that the one heard Paul speak. Well, not only is there a certain man, but this man saw, and I left these blank because I didn't want to stand out right away, but you realize he's seeing Peter and John. It's important who you're seeing, right? It's important who you're hearing. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. God is working effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision and, and working through all 12 apostles. So it's not just seeing anybody, it's seeing Peter and John, the, the two of the three main apostles, two of the twelve apostles to the nation of Israel. Um, they see him going into the temple, so the man asked alms. Look at verse 4 it says, of Acts 3. It says, And Peter fastening his eyes upon him. Hey! This man heard Paul speak, Paul steadfastly beholding him. This man sees Peter and John, and Peter fastens his eyes on the guy. The same incident is taking place. It's amazing. So um, he, he fastened his eyes on him. Um, yeah, I got him numbered. I should look at my board instead of my notes. <laughs> uh, 
Well, this one's, this one's a little different, though. Uh, when, when he's going to ask the alm. In verse 5 it says, and, and, he, and he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, when the man finally walks, I've got to jump ahead on this one. Look down in verse 16. It says, and when Peter, now the crowd is gathered and Peter's preaching Christ, uh, being the Prince of Life in verse 15. But he says in verse 16, And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So Peter is acknowledging two things. One, he's talking about that, that the man that was seeing Peter, Peter said this man is standing because he believed the things that Peter said. When Peter says, such as I have, I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ, this man is believing that Jesus is the Christ. That's the foundation of the kingdom church. So he had the faith to believe as well. And then when Paul over there, he said, stand, what Peter said is the end of verse uh, 6 there, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, notice in verse 6, Peter said. It, over here, Paul said, and eventually, stand. You know, it makes a difference who's saying this. God isn't working in everybody. Not everybody's doing the miracles. But God was working effectually in Paul, and he said, stand. And based on God working through Paul and, and the confirming of Paul's message, the man stood. Here, this is Peter's ministry. I left it blank again. Uh, Peter said, arise. And if it was because Peter said it, the man rose and was healed. But then, verse 7. And he took him by the hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked. <laughs> the same order. The same miraculous. They, they leap before they walk. It's such a miraculous event that takes place there. And as a result of that, it caused a stir among the people. As a result of that, verse 8 says, And he leaping, leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he that sat at the uh, at, at uh, sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened unto them. And the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, and all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel. You know what? It, the miracle that Paul did caused a group of people to gather together and then Paul talked to them about changing their temple worship, right? Here's a whole group of people in Israel. They have a temple worship too, right? But under the new covenant, they're going to worship God a new and living way. And Peter begins to talk to them about their worship of Jesus Christ. And it is going to change uh, their temple worship. So that uh, you have these two incidences and they match so closely and the Holy Spirit is pointing it out when he says a certain man to make you stop and look at those and you see just what Galatians tells you. He that wrought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, confirming the gospel of the circumcision, the same was mighty in Paul to the Gentiles, confirming the gospel of the uncircumcision. Now, I mean, that's just amazing. But that's what the purpose of the miracles are. And, and so that you realize that God is now working with Paul out among the Gentiles. When God is working with Paul out among the Gentiles, the, the whole book of Acts, it, it's really a, a history book. It's not really to teach us the doctrine that Paul taught. We do get a glimpse of it once in a while. It's actually, we read Paul's epistles. Paul writes in Ephesians, he says, When you read, you might understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. That is, when you read his writings, you'll understand what God revealed to him about the age of grace, the mystery of the dispensation of grace. But, but the book of Acts is a book that shows historically that God was dealing with the twelve to the nation of Israel, and God stopped doing that and began something new with the Apostle Paul out among the Gentiles. 
Paul and the Gentiles don't replace what God was doing with Israel. God will fulfill His promises to Israel in the future. In the meantime, God is doing something different, and what He's doing is called the dispensation of the grace of God. With that, let me just kind of give you something that's probably an outline that we might have done right from the beginning, because it's now pertinent for us to realize. That when you're studying the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, Peter gave his first sermon. Acts chapter 13, we kept saying, Paul's first sermon. Acts chapter 3, Peel, P, Peter, P, Peter healed the lame man. Acts chapter 14, Paul healed the lame man. Acts chapter 8 is where, remember where when Paul, uh, Peter was in Samaria, that one of the people in Samaria was Simon the sorcerer who wanted to buy the power to lay hands on people, and Peter had to rebuke him. Remember in Acts chapter 13, when the Paul was, uh, went to Antioch, there that there was uh, Elimaeus the sorcerer. Um, that wasn't Antioch, was it? That was before Antioch. Anyhow, the, yeah, that was before Antioch. But, but anyhow, Paul dealt with uh, Elimaeus the sorcerer. In Acts chapter 5, in fact, do this one. Look at Acts chapter 5. And before I read it to you, get Acts chapter um, 19. And don't let go of the places. Well, yeah, I guess maybe you can, but... Acts chapter 5, this is... We've already studied the verse, but it's talking about, like in verse 12, it says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all one of cord in Solomon's porch. Verse 15, Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. So God began to use such extra ordinary, supernatural, miraculous events with Peter happened there. Well, Acts chapter 19, in verse 6 it says, no, that's not it, Acts 19, no, Acts 19 verse 11, that's why I told you to do a hold of it. Verse 9, Acts 19, 11, it says, The Lord wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons, and diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. Extraordinary supernatural powers proceeding from Paul. You know, everybody tries to mimic this. You get a, you get a napkin in the envelope. A guy tells you to send him an offering, and you'll get healed. But, uh, the, but God's not working... There's no apostles today. God's not doing what he was doing with Peter and Paul. We got the complete revelation. But you can see that the supernatural in Peter and then the supernatural in Paul. I, I told you 19 verse 6. Look at that. Acts 19 verse 6. It says, And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. You know, when, when Peter was to Samaria, they didn't receive the Holy Ghost till Peter and John laid their hands on them, and then they received the Holy Ghost. The same power that Peter had, the Apostle Paul demonstrates that he had. He that wrought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles, Paul said. So that so you see all these parallels as you're going through. In Acts chapter uh, uh, 10, there was an attempt when Peter went to Cornelius, he bowed down to worship him, and Peter said, don't do that. Well, Acts 14, what are they going to do with Paul and Barnabas? They're going to bow down and worship him. They got to say, no, don't do that. In Acts chapter 9, Peter raises Tabitha from the dead. Acts chapter 20, uh, um, you, what's the guy's name? Eutychus. Uh, Paul raised him from the dead. And interestingly, the last of these parallels is Acts chapter 12, and this is the last time we've seen Peter so far in our study, is a time in which Peter was thrown into prison. Acts chapter 28, the book of Acts, ends with Paul imprisoned in Rome. So you see, there's a parallel of their life and their ministry because we've gone from Peter and his ministry to Israel to Paul and his ministry to the Gentiles, and this is of God. That's the point of what's happened there at Lystra, that God is working effectual in Paul, and, and you, have to listen, you have to listen to what Paul has to say. You have to believe Paul's gospel in order to be saved today. And uh, that's what the whole book of Galatians is all about. So, 
that's, that's the purpose of that miracle that took, takes place in Lystra. We'll, we'll look at the response of that when we come back next week. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I thank you for the, the, these things that just fall together that become so clear that the things that we have come to understand about the calling and commissioning of the Apostle Paul is verified uh, in history and by miraculous events that took place uh, to be the truth of your word. And we thank you today that as we study your Bible and can see the different message, the different people, uh, that we also see the fact that you confirmed uh, your message in Paul that when we believe that, we are believing your message to us today. And so we thank you for uh, being able to see it the way that we've studied it tonight and pray that we can help others to understand what you're accomplishing today, what the message is, what the gospel is, called the gospel of the grace of God that saves us and gives us everlasting life. In Christ's name we pray, amen.